Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God is never going to let us down. Hallelujah. I just love when I come to church, you know, when you come to church and you don't know what you're going to expect and you still hear something from the worship, you hear something from the speaker, you hear something just from somebody in the room and it's just like, I needed to hear that on today. And I just needed to be reminded that God is able. God is able and he's never gonna let me down. Not going to, he's never gonna, G-O-N-N-A. Sometimes you just need a gonna in your spirit that he's never gonna let you down. So I just give God glory for this moment. The word, What I'm already receiving from the Holy Spirit is already a blessing unto me. Uh, I greet all of y'all. Hello, everybody. Hello, Double Love in the building. Double Love streaming online. I am Minister Evelyn Jean-Francois, and it is an honor and a privilege to stand here before you. Uh, it's my third sermon here at Double Love. Bless the love. We get <laughs> three of them, not both of them, three of them. We are so, I am so thankful and humbled, and it is just a lovely moment now. Who my peoples. I'm happy to announce that the Lord has given me a word to deliver for y'all. So I just want to thank God for that, and I want to thank God for our leaders, our pastors, Dr. Gabby, soon to be Dr. Andrew. Thank you for allowing a little baby minister like myself to stand here. It is, I'm humbled again and again. So everybody who loves the Lord and loves the word of the Lord, if you could please open up your Bibles to Judges, Judges chapter 7, Judges chapter 7, verses 2 to 7. Amen? Amen. When you have it, say amen. Amen. And I will begin reading. Got it. I love it. I love it. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand delivered me. Now, therefore, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. Then 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. And the Lord said to Gideon, these people are still too many. Take them down to the water and I will test them for you there. And any one of whom I say to you, this one shall go with you, shall go with you. And who any one of whom I say to you, this one shall not go with you, shall not go. So he brought the people down to the water and the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set by himself. Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. And the number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouths, was 300 men. But all the rest of the people knelt down to drink water. Verse 7. And the Lord said to Gideon, With the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hand. And let all the others go, every man to his home. The word of the Lord is blessed. Let us pray. <sighs> Heavenly Father, merciful God, thank you. Thank you. It is your breath in our lungs. Father God, I thank you for this moment here, O oh Lord, where we can hear from you and what you have to say. Father God, I pray over those who are hearing and will be hearing, O oh God, those who are streaming, those who are in this room. I pray that you open up their hearts and prepare their spirits to hear from you, O oh God, that with whatever they hear, O oh Lord, you may direct them in the places that they, may, they should go. Lord, we glorify you. We thank you in advance for your Holy Spirit dwelling among us. Lord, you are wonderful. We thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And amen. Hi, everybody again. <laughs> usually, usually when we hear about this passage, some of us are familiar, some of us might not be. But when we hear from this passage, we always hear about Gideon and only 300 men. 300 men who conquered the Midianites. And that's true. This is the story that we are talking about. But today, I want you to know that my message is not about numbers per se. It's not about quantities. It's more, so, so being the fact that it's not all about numbers, I need my numerologist to, to put the calculators away. I need you guys to focus on the message here for you today. 
This message won't be about numbers, but it is about credit. Sometimes I think we read the Bible too fast when we read about Gideon and his 300 men. We talk about those 300 men, but we don't talk enough about why Gideon only had 300 men. In verse 2 of the scripture that we've read, the Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Reading God say anything is too anything for him was conflicting for me. Because nothing is too hard for God. Nothing is too impossible for our God. Nothing is too low. The, the mountains aren't too high. The valleys aren't too low. The rivers aren't too wide. But here, the people are too many for God. We, when we read our Bibles, because we read our Bibles, don't we? We do, right? And if we read past Judges 7 into Judges 8, we actually learn that the army that Gideon's people were fighting against, the Midianites, totaled up to 125 and more, 125,000 and more. So that means that the Midianites were 125,000 plus, and that was not too hard for God. God told Gideon that the people with Gideon were too much. That number that was with Gideon was about 32,000 people standing with Gideon, and 32,000 was too much for God, as verse 2 tells us, because lest Israel boast over me, saith the Lord. Lest Israel say to themselves, my hand has delivered me, meaning God could not yet deliver Israel, God could not yet deliver Midianite into the hands of the Israelites because the people, the 32,000 had been too much for him. Almost as if the Israelites, the number standing with Gideon at that moment was keeping God from doing what he said he would do, like the word, like the script, the song we sang earlier. We know God is going to do what he said he would do, but that 32 stood in his way. And I love the Bible. The version that I read for you was ESV of the scripture. But KJV, the King James Version, when it reads verse 2, it says, I cannot, he says, it's too, the people are too many for me unless they would vaunt over the Lord. They would boast over the Lord. And then I love the New Revised Standard Version even more because they, because here God says that they would take the credit from me. God could not yet deliver the Midianites into the hands of the Israelites because they would take the credit from God. And to me, I've already said, I already put out the numbers. We got 32,000 Israelites. We got 125,000 plus Midianites. So for me, looking on the outside of the scripture, the testimony is already there because there's already a deficit there. There's 32,000 Israel of Israel and 125,000 of Midian. They're already outnumbered. The odds are already stacked up against them. It should have been already, the, the God could have delivered them. It already looks impossible. But that number, something about that number held God back because they would glorify themselves. Something about that 32,000. But then when we read more in chapter 7, even 10,000 was too much. Even 10,000 against 125,000 plus was too much because that 10,000 number would have the Israelites say unto themselves, my hand has delivered me. God had to bring that total number to a place where they would not and could not take the credit away from God. And to me, to, in my theological uh, consideration, I've always wanted to say that, uh, that says more about Israel than it does about God. It says more about Israel, the fact that God had to bring them to the number 300 versus 125,000 plus to make sure that the Israelites would not take the credit from God. And that's kind of big to me. The question that we're going to be tackling on today is what keeps us from giving credit to God? And how does that lack of credit affect the way we fight our battles? If it were up to me, I had a little difficulty titling this sermon, but the best that I could come up with was impact on your credit score. Mm. 
What is the impact on your credit score? Now, in order for us to get deep into this, I think we need to get into those 31,700 that didn't make the cut, right? If you ask anyone that knows me, they don't call on me to do the mental math. So bless the Lord, I did do this on the calculator. I made sure that it was 31,700 that we was getting into because something about that total number of people kept God from doing what he said he would do. Let us get into it. So in order for us to get into those 31,700, let's really get into the people that we're dealing with. These people of Israel, right? The peop this, this Israel isn't the Israel you might be readily familiar with from earlier scriptures in the Bible. With this Israel, this Israel, they, both Moses and Joshua are dead for this Israel. Meaning, they haven't dealt with 400 years of enslavement with Pharaoh. They haven't dealt with the stubbornness of Pharaoh. They haven't dealt with walking through the Red Sea. They know nothing about, let me put it like this, they know nothing about having to use a phone book to find somebody's number. They don't know nothing about having to hang up the house phone so that you can use the internet. They don't know nothing about Wi-Fi. They don't know nothing about bus tokens. Remember bus tokens with a little hole in the middle? They don't know nothing about what people be talking about. This is Israel I'm talking about. Let's get back, right? Israel don't know nothing about what's gone before. They don't know nothing about making bricks from straw. They know nothing about what, well, if not that they don't know nothing, they haven't seen it for themselves. All that they have now that Moses is gone and, jo and Joshua is gone, they have judges appointed by the Lord to instruct them in what they should do. But because we read our Bibles, right, because we get into Judges, the book of Judges, Judges 2 explains clearly that when the judge died, the people returned to their corrupt ways, behaving worse than those that lived before them. They went after other gods, serving and worshiping them, and they refused to give up their evil practices and stubborn ways. So this is the Israel that we're dealing with. Those, that's, the, that's the mind of who the God is trying to deliver the Midianites into their hands. And then we can learn more about Israel from the call of Gideon, right? We know this is 300 with Gideon, but let's learn a little bit about Gideon. When we read the book of Judges, we learn that when Gideon received his call, an angel of the Lord just eloquently presented himself before him and said, mighty warrior of valor, the Lord is with you. But this is how Gideon responds. He was like, but sir, he was like, if the Lord is with us, then why has all of this happened to us? You see, when the, Lord, when the angel of the Lord comes before Gideon, Gideon is threshing wheat in a wine press. What he's basically doing to make it plain, he's, he's at the wine store looking for produce, looking for fresh fruit. It doesn't make sense. The oppression that the Israelites were going through under Midian, every time they harvested something, the Midianites would snatch it up. So here, Gideon is like, why has all of this happened to us? And where are all the miracles that our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. That's what Gideon said. This is the same Gideon that God has called to lead this 300 men. So now that we know a little bit more about Gideon, now that we know a little bit more about who the Israelites were, we see the mind and heart of these people. We understand that they already considered themselves abandoned by God. So could you imagine a monster that would have created if 32 people who think that God is not with them went and, re and got the victory? What kind of pride would come out of that? What kind of boasting would come out of that? What kind of credit would come from a generation of people who do not believe the Lord is with them? I advise you to be careful when you feel like God has forsaken you. Because you can be tempted, when you feel alone, you are tempted to believe that you're, when you come out of that isolation, you're tempted to believe that it is the Lord who saved you. Knowing and acknowledging God at all times keeps you from taking the credit away from him. So when they say, I will bless the Lord at all times, it's not just so we keep our lips busy. It is to keep our mind focused on who, who deserves the credit, even in our darkest situations. 
It, it, it's not just you when you're in that doctor's office receiving that diagnosis and being delivered from that diagnosis. It's not just you who's in that job interview giving your, your finest cover letter, your finest resume. It's not just you when you receive that offer letter. And, when, and even when you're in a moment of lowness, even when it's as simple as cleaning your depression space, when you come out of that space, it's not just you who happen to sort your things all together and have you in a right place. All glory, all credit belongs to God. So I will say lack of knowledge leads us from taking, it leads us to taking credit from God. So I would advise you to keep the credit of God, keep the knowledge of God that you have with you at all times. So that does not keep you from giving credit to God who is deserving of the credit at all times. Amen. Amen. Point number two, fear keeps us from crediting God. Your fear affects the way you glorify God and the way you fight your battles. Let us get back into the text here. God tells Gideon, after, after he says to Gideon that there are too many of us, too many of the Israelites, he says to Gideon, tell the people this. Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. And after hearing what was said, the Bible says that 22,000 people departed. What are you trying to emphasize? I know you're thinking, what are you trying to say, Minister Evelyn? The world might tell you things like, do it scared. Get it done scared. But let me tell you that fighting your battles afraid does not give glory to God the way you think it does. <laughs> Sorry. Fighting your battles afraid does not give glory to God because fear is the opposite of faith. When you fight your battles, it is not fear that is fueling you. It is your faith that is fueling you. When you fight your battles, it is your fear that keeps you from believing God. When you fight your battles from a place of faith, you need to understand that you, when you fight from faith, you are not fighting from an empty vessel. Fear takes from you, but faith gives to you. Faith gives you that, that deposit. Faith gives you that life that you need to continue fighting. So we see here... That when you are in fear, when you, when you spend time in fear, the way those 22,000 uh, same were living in fear, you spend more time quantifying your reasonings to be scared. So yes, those 22,000 probably thought to themselves, you see over there, that's 125,000. I'm already 32,000. The odds are already stacked against us. I'm going to make my way out. Because according to the command, the command already gave them permission to leave, right? So fear is something that distracts you. And the thing is about these 22K, these 22,000, we really never really, will never really know what exactly they were afraid of. There's a chance that they weren't all afraid of the same thing, but 22,000 show enough left when given the opportunity. Sometimes, it, maybe it wasn't the fear of the Midianites. Maybe it might have been fear of themselves, fear of their legacy, fear of their abilities. Because as we know, they know the stories of how God has delivered them from Egypt. They know the stories of passing through the Red Sea. They know what lies in, inside of them. They know their legacy. But they could, could it be that they were also afraid of this? What I, I have a favorite quote from Marianne Williamson that reads, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Yes, Pastor Andrew. So, what am I saying here? Fear does not glorify God. Yeah. And as we see here with the 22,000, fear doesn't let you stick around to find out how the story ends either. And it doesn't allow you to give the credit to God. Fear keeps you from giving credit to God. Lack of knowledge keeps you from giving credit to God. But how you live also affects the way you glorify God. Let's get back in the text, because once the 22,000 scared and, 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 and afraid folks had left, we were left here with 10,000 that remained. But yet we know in the scripture, scripture tells us that even 10,000 was too much. 10,000, according to the reasoning of God, was too many still for God to deliver the Midianites into the hands of the Israelites because they would still take the credit away from God. 10,000 versus 125,000. I know I said I wasn't going to talk about numbers, but we're here. We're here in the text still. So to filter through this 10,000 number, God tests these 10,000. 
What I love about the scripture here is that the first filter that God used was a command. If you're scared, go home. If you're scared, go to church. If you're scared, be out. But this second one was a test, meaning that the decision was left in the hands of this 10,000. And the filter being that it was a, the second filter being that it was a test, the test was concerning the technique. The test was concerning how they do the things that they need to do. The technique they used to drink the water would determine who would fight and who would be sent home. See, the scripture tells us that those who lapped and drank the water as a dog would, they stayed as the 300, and those who knelt directly to the water, they got sent home. I don't know why God preferred the lapping over the kneeling. I can't speak to that. But what I will say is that how you get things done doesn't always bring glory to God, even if you got the same outcome. The way that they knelt down to the water, they still got their water. The, the way they knelt down to, to, to lap like dogs, they still got their water. But, but it was something about the how. When God told Gideon to, to, when God was testing the people with Gideon, God told Gideon to pay attention to how they are drinking the water. And this leads me to believe, what was it about how that differentiated them from the rest? Was it, was it the fact that the, the people who, the 300 were the minority and the, those who knelt were the majority? Was that what it is? Is it, is, it, is it the simple things that we're considering complicated that play a definitive role on the ways that we give credit to God? Because seemingly if the ways that everybody else is doing, it's the norm, it's the trend, it's what everyone else is doing, and that might make you think that this is normal behavior. So what's the point of giving credit to God? Versus those who lap, those who bring the water to them and, and drink it with their hands, they might consider that this takes a bit more work and I will glorify God. But all that we're learning from here, no matter where you, whether you're a lapper, whether you're a kneeler, what we need to pay attention to is the way we live our life affects whether or not we give glory to God. How do you give? How does the way you give affect the way you give glory to God? How does the way you pray affect the way you give glory to God? How, do the, how does the ways that you do things, is it similar to the way others do it? And is that all right with you? But for 97,000 of these people, their technique did not honor God. So I, I, I bring this up to have you think about your own technique and how whether or not it limits or it, it pushes you to give glory to God. So here we are, we, we done tallied over 31,700 folks that went back home. Wow. They talk about the 300 that fought against the Midianites and won, but what about those who were sent home because of poor faith and poor technique? Do they not go down in the history books somehow? What happens to those who are sent home in times of battle when it really counts? I think what I received from it, what Holy Spirit told me was, if you find yourself at home in times of battle, you might be too comfortable. Is your comfort zone keeping you from giving glory to God? Going back to my first point about fear, maybe they really weren't scared about the right things, but they stayed in their comfort zone because at least here at home where I was sent to stay to hear about it, at least I don't got to be out there. At least when I'm, not on the, when I'm not on the battleground, I don't have to testify about the, what the Lord could have, should have, might have done for me because I'm at home. I'm not on the ground. This is what the 31,700 have to deal with for the rest of their days, I imagine that they have to think about the fact that they can't tell the story. They can't talk about the credit that God deserves. They can't even contribute to the conversation. They're just reading the, they're just reading the timeline. They're not in the build, they're not outside the way that they think they should have been. So in closing, what I wanna tell you is that this story about Gideon is, some, is one that we've heard often. I need you to know that if you, are, if you have ever been in a group chat of like 17 people to go somewhere, and when you get to the airport, there's only four of y'all, you're, you're Gideon. You're, you're Gideon. If you've ever been in the workplace and you've CC'd everybody you needed to CC, you, did, you went through all of the strategizing meetings, you did all the preparatory, you published the deck, the deck is ready, but when you get in the room with the execs, you're the only one talking. You just might have been Gideon in that situation. Finding yourself in a Gideon situation might be a call for you to assess your credit score. 
Is fear keeping you from giving glory to God even in a time like this? Is your technique and how you live in your life affecting the way you're glorifying God in a sticky time like this? Or maybe it's your comfort zone. Your fight could very well contain 32,000. Imagine a faith that we exercise where God saw the 32 and was like, that's, that's good enough for me. But when we find ourselves in these situations with 32,000, 10,000, or 300, we know that with those numbers, only one of those numbers resulted in the glory of God. And I urge you, I urge you to do your best to exercise a faith that doesn't keep God from giving you what you need. We know that God is going to give you what you need. This is our God who's able, who wants to do exceedingly above what we can ask, think, or imagine. God is going to do it regardless, 32 or 100, two, two of us, three of us, four of us. He's going to do it. But if our faith can allow God to open up our hands a little bit, give us a capacity that, that doesn't scare the folk, it gives a, still that rich testimony. Sometimes we don't need to always have to be in a, in, a, in a scar situation for us to give a testimony. We shouldn't have to wait till we only had 300 to say, I'm going to give credit to God now. I urge, and I close, I urge to exercise a faith that when God sees us in a battle where we're already outnumbered, where the victory is already ours, I urge you to exercise a faith where God can give you all that you can need, all. And with that, God bless you. Yeah.